Okay, welcome to Their Democracy and Ours. My name is David Palumbo Liu, and I'll be introducing the event and talking a little bit about its genesis, its main goals, and then I'll be handing the event over to Astor Taylor. Uh, the event is sponsored by Jacobin Magazine and Haymarket Books. Haymarket Books is a radical, independent, nonprofit book publisher based in Chicago. Among the many vital authors it has published are Angela Davis, Astra Taylor, Debt Collective, Arundhati Roy, Mark Lamont Hill, and Kianga Yamata Taylor. Jacobin Magazine is a democratic socialist publication. It's out quarterly in print, so please subscribe and support their work. A link to get a $10 yearly subscription is in the event description on YouTube. And please press like and subscribe to their YouTube channel, which will allow the video this video feed to reach more people. So again, tonight's speakers are Angela Davis and Astra Taylor. Angela Y. Davis is the author of several books, including Women, Race, and Class, Are Prisons Obsolete? And Freedom is a Constant Struggle. She's the subject of the acclaimed documentary, Free Angela and All Political Prisoners, and is distinguished professor emerita at the University of California, Santa Cruz. Astra Taylor's writing and filmmaking are grounded in her work as an organizer. She co-founded the Debt Collective, a union for debtors, and co-authored the Debt Collective's new manifesto just out from Haymarket, Can't Pay, Won't Pay, The Case for Economic Disobedience and Debt Abolition. So how did this event come about um, and what are some of its topics? Um, more than a year ago, um, a class I teach at Stanford called Scholarship and Activism organized this event. Uh, and we very much wanted to hear from Astra Taylor, watch her film and um, hear her thoughts on the film and also have Angela Davis on stage with her uh, to um, exchange ideas on two main topics, but we're gonna, I'm sure, reach others tonight. But the first, the two main topics were, first, what is democracy? How is this, has it been manifested for good and bad? And what's the difference between a democracy that lives up to its name and its potential and one that simply borrows the name for the sake of altogether different purposes? As for Taylor's book, Democracy May Not Exist, but we will miss it when it's gone. And her film both capture many ways to address these questions from historical, conceptual, and activist perspectives. The second topic we wanted to foreground was what kind of activism will it take to bring about our democracy? And in particular, how can different generations and different groups of people work together? I've had the privilege of knowing Angela Davis for some time now, and there are a million reasons why I would want her to be part of this event. But the, the main reason I wanted to have her here is because of a remarkable lecture she gave in Pretoria, the Steve Biko Memorial Lecture, which was entitled Legacies and Unfinished Activisms. And in it, she gives probably the most inspiring and heartfelt and uplifting talk about precisely the idea of working together, different generations, different kinds of people for a common purpose. Because the pandemic struck, we weren't able to have it in person and we were looking for a sponsor. I write occasionally for Jack Ben. I have a book coming up from Haymarket and so I turned to Baskar and Anthony, and they very generously offered to take up the sponsorship and produce this show. So my heart goes out to them, as well as to Angela and Astra, who are going to spend the next few minutes going into this topic. And I want to thank you for being here. And with that, I'll hand things over to Astra. Thank you so much, 
I want to also thank our hosts, uh, Haymarket Books and Jacobin Magazine. And I really want to acknowledge you, David, and thank you for visioning this event and sticking with it uh, despite all of the disruptions of the last eight months. Of course, it's a huge honor to be speaking to Angela Davis. Everyone tuned in knows why. She's brilliant, she's brave, she's engaged. She embodies the title of that book we just saw, Freedom as a Constant Struggle, but also puts the joy, I think, in struggle, right? That it's not just struggle as duty, but struggle is something that gives us meaning and pleasure. So thank you, Angela, for being here. Our theme is democracy. And I guess I just wanna begin by saying, I didn't always like the word democracy. I came of age in the aughts under the war on terror and George W. Bush saying he was bringing democracy to the Middle East really shaped my perception. I was not interested in democracy. It sounded hollow, corrupt. I was interested in words like liberation, equality, socialism, communism, revolution, anything but democracy. And I began to rethink my ambivalence in 2011 when there was a wave of global movements from the Arab Spring to the movement of the squares to Occupy Wall Street, which I was very involved in, demanding real democracy and saying, this, in all these contexts, what we have isn't it. So almost 10 years later, um, my conviction now is that democracy is a concept that we need to struggle over and that for all of its frustrating vagueness, um, and you know, it's a hard word to define, it is also inherently radical. And that's why the powerful have always despised it and why they have tried to co-opt it or limit our understanding and practice of it. So there are lots of ways to define democracy. Each one raises a lot of questions, a lot of conundrums, paradoxes. That's what I write about in my book, how democracy contains all these paradoxes. Uh, but broken down into its component parts, it means the demos, the people, have kratos, have power, and we can, and I think will, have to endlessly struggle over how we define the people and how we rule, how we hold that power. It's always open to debate, to contestation, and I think ultimately to expansion, radical expansion. Here's another way of defining democracy, rule of the poor. That was Aristotle's definition. He said, democracy is always rule of the many, and the many are by definition not rich. So even in that basic understanding, democracy has a class component, right? And that's why the rich and the powerful prefer oligarchy, which is rule of the few. So uh, a warning before we proceed, we're not gonna spend a lot of time on the election, on the news. I endorse uh, Angela's advice that she's given elsewhere on how to approach it. I think of voting less as something, you know, as like voting for a candidate we love and more as voting for, uh, voting for uh, an adversary I wanna fight or the political terrain I wanna fight on. And I'd rather fight centrist than reactionary. So we are gonna expand democracy beyond just this limited conception of democracy as electoral politics, even though we will of course touch on that. Uh, so before I hand it to Angela, we're going to show a two minute clip from my film, What is Democracy? And in this movie I, I spoke to, I, I wanted to hear from everyone. <laughs> I went around and I, spoke to philosophers, to politicians, to, to school children, to refugees, and tried to uh, approach them as philosophical subjects and get their thoughts. I was in Miami in late 2015, uh, and some of my friends were involved uh, with the Dream Defenders that were sponsoring Angela's talk, uh, and my visit just happened to coincide with it, so I ended up filming her lecture. So after the clip, I'd love for you, Angela, to pick up on some of the themes in it and to pick up on this concept of abolition democracy, a, a title of another one of your books, and talk about what that means in this context of a, a historic election, but also you know, a, a bigger political crisis, a moment of uh, unprecedented protest against police brutality and a pandemic that has led to the deaths of over, the deaths of over 200,000 people in this country, most of which, or many of which were preventable and are a consequence of the contempt for human life and the greed uh, that uh, drives the current administration. So without further ado, let's play the clip. Well, I haven't been to Miami in a long time. Let me say that. The, the first time I came to, well, I won't talk about the first time I came to Miami. <laughs> uh, I was running from the FBI the first time I came. <laughs> abolish rather than fix the system. The system cannot be fixed. I always like to go back to W.E.B. Du Bois and his notion of abolition. 
Because so many of the problems we're confronting are a direct consequence of the fact that slavery was never fully abolished. argues that the abolition of slavery would not simply be the dismantling of the institution, but rather the creation of new conditions, new institutions, a new democracy. Because what he argued was that the democracy that we were all familiar with could not be the same if former slaves began to participate on a basis of equality. It would have to be a very different democracy, not the democracy of the founding white fathers. And so that challenge That was the challenge of the end of the 19th century. It was the challenge of the 20th century. And it remains the challenge of the 21st century. Wow, that was uh, 2015, huh? Um, Yeah, um, I think that we can learn a great deal uh, from W.E.B. Du Bois, about the nature of democracy. First of all, it's not a unitary term. Mm -hmm. Uh, Democracy is not the same across time, across space. Uh, And uh, too often we think of democracy as one thing, uh, you know, rule of the people, rule of the majority. and um, it, it, it tends to assume um, an inside and outside. And so therefore, so many struggles have been about bringing the marginalized, those who have been marginalized in relation to the existing democracy into the fold of the democracy. And uh, that is where uh, we make um, many mistakes. Uh, and I think W.E.B. Du Bois and emphasizing what um, um, abolitionists were evoking uh, during that period uh, um, argued that um, the democracy could not remain the same and respond to the needs of those who had been previously enslaved. Uh, the Uh, the democracy itself would have to be transformed. Um, And as I said, um, um, new institutions would have to be uh, created, uh, 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 ways of guaranteeing that that the democracy uh, could respond to the needs of a people who had been uh, held in chains uh, Uh, for so many decades. Uh, When we think of democracy as uh, unitary, as a unitary concept, as one thing, as unchangeable, and our goal is simply to bring um, more and more of the marginalized uh, um, populations into the democracy, Uh, we fail to recognize that oftentimes it is the very structure of that democracy that has created the marginalization in the first place. Uh, and therefore, by simply including people, actually this is a, this is a critique of the strategies of uh, diversity and inclusion. Uh, and these days, um, the, the assumption is that any institution that wants to join the struggle against racism simply has to create their um, their office, of, their office of diversity and inclusion, uh, bring those in who were previously marginalized, but pay very little in, pay very little attention to the process of of transforming and changing and 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 rendering uh, more just uh, the actual structure that was responsible for the uh, marginalization. 
So um, I think we have a great deal to learn from um, Du Bois and his notion of abolition democracy, uh, uh, which was never fulfilled, of course, in the aftermath of uh, the um, so-called abolition of slavery, the negative abolition of slavery, the, the, um, uh, the, the way in which the institution itself was prohibited. Uh, and I think that in, uh, in the year 2020, we're faced with basically the same issues that Du Bois was writing about in Black Reconstruction. And we're doing, as I've said many times, we're actually now, it seems to me, preparing to do work which should have happened over 150 years ago. Yes, it makes me think of James, the, the quote I think from James Baldwin, do I want to be integrated into a burning house, right? Or something to that effect that we we um, want to transform. Malcolm said a sinking ship and, yeah. and um, Jimmy said, yeah, a burning house. Yeah, and the, and you know, thinking too about the fires, the, the fires raging on the West Coast and, and the burning being, you know, very literal right now in some places. That brings me, I mean, it, 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 this is exactly, I think, what so many of us are wrestling with right now, is that there's, there's a tension between participating in the system as it is, that a system that, that is so problematic, that disappoints us, <laughs> that exploits us, um, you know, of course, at varying degrees, but is, is a, a deadly and destructive system, and wanting, but also wanting to keep our eye on a transformative horizon. So, you know, I want to go back, you, you talk about the democracy of the founding white fathers, and there's all the ways that our, the political system we are operating in, it was founded on so many exclusions, um, the exclusion of enslaved people, formerly enslaved people, women, men without property, and those exclusions still reverberate today. And we could talk about, you know, why they were so averse to democracy, why the founders abhorred democracy. Um, they were interested in minority rights. They wanted to protect the rights of a minority, they, the opulent, they said, of landlords, of slaveholders. Um, and the structures they devised are still with us and still constrain us. And it's frustrating, you know. Um, and we could go on about all the ways our current system is very undemocratic, from the Supreme Court um, now promising to suppress any progressive legislation to the Senate, and it goes on and on. So this tension, I guess I just want you to speak to this tension of operating within the system as it is working towards an abolitionist horizon, this, this, this um, expansive horizon, but also I think uh, being aware of the fact that progress that has been made can be rolled back. That's what Du Bois's work on reconstruction teaches us, right? And we're seeing all sorts of attempts to roll back what limited political and civil rights people have, uh, you know, and, you know, in a basic way, you can look at this voter suppression that's happening. I'm in North Carolina now. Um, you can look at the disenfranchisement of felons. The state of Florida, you know, the, the public voted to reenfranchise uh, former felons, and then the Republican legislature said, well, no, not if they have debts, uh, court debts, we're not gonna let them vote. Uh, so, yeah, I'm just wondering if you could speak to operating within these, this, this tension, keeping all of those levels in, in mind. Um, I guess one thing I'll say is I think that conservatives sort of do a better job, just, and I'm thinking about democracy in a very limited terms in terms of elections or political system, but of uh, trying to alter the rules of the game. So not just trying to get inclusion, which is what you know progressives and liberals have been after, including ourselves, access to the ballot, but um, yeah, rewriting the actual rules by which you're included. Uh, and so, you know, I think, I, I think, um, you know, we are frustrated by presidential elections every four years, but I think in, in uh, the rest of the time, we do need to think about reforms that would change the rules of the game. So rather ranked choice voting or, you know, I, um, uh, ways to actually um, uh, transform the system that might be uh, actually achievable on some level if we're strategic uh, instead of just thinking about participation. Mm -hmm. well. I think that um, if we um, simply look at democracy as a form of political rule, mm -hmm. um, we exclude a whole range of issues uh, that really ought to be attended to in discussions uh, uh, regarding a democracy. 
Um, yeah, why is it that uh, this myth of, um, of, of the U.S. as um, um, the first democracy, um, writ large, uh, continues to command uh, uh, so much attention uh, when, you know, as we, um, you know, pointed out, and, and as you said in the very beginning, um, it was actually um, what you might call a democracy of the minority, <laughs> uh, which, uh, which, which ought to be oxymoronic in, 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 when we think about the, the ways in which we think about democracy. Uh, um, but um, um, the, you know, what, what, what would be interesting would be to talk about the economic implications of democracy. What would an economic democracy entail? Uh, uh, um, you know, what about um, um, social dimensions of, of democracy? Uh, and how is democracy um, changed in relation to the particular economic system, um, uh, which um, constitutes the foundation for that democracy. Of course, um, you know, Marx um, talked about bourgeois democracy, and I think it's really important to retain uh, some of that specificity uh, uh, that um, the democracies that we are um, accustomed to were democracies uh, designed to guarantee a political power from uh, the middle classes, uh, from the bourgeoisie, uh, in, in in relation to um, uh, the um, the old feudal system. So, um, what would it be like to um, imagine a democracy uh, in which um, um, everyone? got to participate on a basis of equality, um, economically, culturally, socially, uh, politically. And I think it becomes much more difficult uh, to come up with a, um, a kind of uh, um, um, nice definition of democracy in that way. It becomes too complicated. Uh, uh, if we argue that, that Everyone, for example, by virtue of living in a particular uh, region should be considered a citizen and should be able to participate in um, the governing and the economies. Uh, um, what would that mean? Um, I love this I love a line of questions. So I think, you know, one, and this gets to what I was wanting to ask you and think about next, which is, you know, the the relationship of democracy to the economic system. And so, you know, I, I two things, I guess. One is I've noticed, and I noticed this when I was going around and interviewing people for my film and in interviewing conservatives, young conservatives in particular, I expected them to tell me how capitalism was democratic, right? And to speak, to 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 use the rhetoric of democracy. What I found, especially in the days after Donald Trump won the 2016 election, was a self-conscious, a, 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 an, a knowledge that they were actually never going to win majorities. And so there was this sense that democracy is bad. We depend on minoritarian institutions like the Electoral College. And forget that 20th century marriage of, of capitalism and democracy, that Cold War marriage, we're gonna take the capitalism part, you know, and we're, we're uh, we are going to be sort of self-consciously elite. And we see this now in the last week, a lot of prominent Republicans have tweeted, hey, we're not a democracy anyway, right? You know, and reverting to actually this American tradition of being anti-democratic. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, uh, and then I think on the other side, people are realizing that actually we need to marry socialism and democracy, that actually you need to have that economic underpinning, uh, you need to have the economic equality, to have anything approaching even liberal democracy, to have liberal rights and freedoms that we're supposed to have, right? We actually don't even have them because there's so much inequality. Um, so I think that, you know, but I, what you were getting at at least, or what I heard was that, you know, it's true when, that we need a different economic system, 
uh, but but I don't think our I don't think that solves all of our questions. And what I like to think about is how under socialism, under a communist horizon, a socialist horizon, all of these rich democratic conundrums would come to the fore, right? We'd we'd suddenly have all these really uh, thorny democratic problems. How do we actually share power? How do we how do we you know uh, live in a world where there is common wealth, right, and not um, uh, where things are provided in common, but we also want people to have control over their lives. And on, you know, how do we decide who gets to make what decisions? So I think uh, the democratic questions would actually just be much richer and more profound. Well, you know, I've also been um, questioning um, whether the the outcome of the last election mm -hmm. might have been different if. Um, more attention had been paid to uh, those who um, are experiencing the um, impact of global capitalism, uh, the, uh, uh, you know, those uh, poor white families who now recognize that their children are not going to be better off uh, than they were. Uh, if we had, um, if we had developed strategies that would have permitted us to recognize that so many of the existing problems in this country are directly related to this, the rise and the spread of global capitalism. Um, as a matter of fact, uh, we used to have more economic democracy than we have today. It used to be that uh, people uh, could expect to be treated at any hospital um, if they were ill. Uh, Hospitals and and the whole healthcare system had not been thoroughly privatized uh, uh, as as it has been, which is one of the reasons uh, why uh, the uh, COVID nineteen pandemic has created such a state of emergency, uh, particularly with respect to hospital beds, uh, because empty hospital beds are not profitable, uh, uh, and and so I. I, I think that if one one looks at that the 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 impact of global capitalism, the way in which it uh, is very much an explanation for the rise of the prison industrial complex, uh, uh, the um, disestablishment of so many of the institutions that used to serve as a safety net, economic safety net uh, for people, uh, increasing privatization of education, the privatization of healthcare, and so the uh, the, the the failure to uh, uh, develop uh, more um, institutions devoted to the public good and the deterioration of those that existed have um, created a terrain in which poverty has uh, expanded um, not only among communities of color, black, brown, indigenous communities, but also among white people. And um, the uh, current occupant of the White House uh, 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 called upon those uh, who were suffering the impact of global capitalism, uh, providing false, uh, suggesting false solutions, uh, uh, a return to another era, a return to an era in which um, um, uh, the industrialized economy in this country uh, responded to the needs of people. And that is, is that, that's not going to happen. Uh, uh, all the jobs that have gone all over the world, particularly to the global South, are not going to return uh, to uh, the U.S. Uh, mm -hmm. So I think it really is important to uh, consider the ways in which economic transformations have a direct impact on possibilities for democracy. Yes, I mean, and and certainly, you know, I was making the film right before the 2016 election. I talked to a lot of people who were very frustrated and, you know, wanted to, you know, basically, you know, felt utterly uh, hopeless and for good reason. I mean, we we know lots of research shows that regular people have basically no influence on on public policy. One. I mean, one problem, right, is the the dearth of unions and the tax on. And this brings me to another question I, I wanted to ask, um, which is uh, just the history of 
uh, actually of, of red baiting and attacks on the left and the role that is played in undermining democracy. Um, so I think it speaks to what you were just laying out, right? The lack of unions <laughs> and they're not robust, the lack of associations where regular people can get a radical political education and, and you know, be, be treated as thinking active participants and think about the economy in a critical way. Uh, you know, I've been reading labor history through this pandemic. That's been one of my pastimes. It's a thinking about the Haymarket generation, for example, to speak to our hosts here, the Red Scare. I mean, I don't need to tell you about attack on the left in the 1960s. And those seem to be um, uh, that's, you know, certainly heating up with this administration um, and, uh, you know, the the way the Trump administration talks about Antifa and socialism and is sending troops to cities. And then occasionally, you know, it sometimes seems too that centrists, that liberal centrists would rather like lose to the right than let the left win. Um, and so this, but this demonization or criminalization or, you know, uh, of the left, I think has played a really powerful role in shaping American democracy as we know it. And I was just wondering mm -hmm. if you could speak on that and maybe think about, you know, what might be in store for us. Yeah, and uh, there, of course, um, Contemporary efforts to uh, evoke uh, uh, the, the the red baiting of the past uh, in the way in which um, the current occupant of the the White House uh, uh, attempted to uh, discredit the current uh, Democratic um, vice presidential candidate by by calling her a communist uh, and. Um, <sighs> Well, I, I won't. I won't comment on that. Uh, uh, but uh, I, I, I do think it's important in this conversation about democracy to recognize the role that socialists and communists have played in struggling for democracy uh, in in this country. Um, I, I I know that for. Um, for, for decades, uh, there were ways in which people in other countries who were involved in socialist and communist uh, 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 struggles referred to um, the other America. Uh, you know, there was the America, you know, represented, you know, by the um, those in power, and then there were the unions. There were the struggles against racism, uh, the struggles against. Uh, um, uh, sexism, and 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 I think that uh, you were saying that you've been reading a lot of history recently, and what we've lost in our um, historical accounts is precisely the role that um, communists and other socialists played in expanding the possibilities of democracy in this country. Uh, we have unemployment and insurance precisely as a consequence of the struggles in the, the 1930s. Uh, 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 and um, if one looks at the role that, um, that black communists played in the South in creating the terrain for what eventually came to be known as the civil rights uh, movement, that has, basically been um, eradicated from uh, mainstream uh, uh, representations of, of, of history. And as we are engaging in what people are calling a um, racial reckoning, um, I think that the terminology should be broader. It's not just, it's not simply a racial reckoning. It's a, it's a, it's a reckoning uh, with the, um, the, history of, of, of this country, uh, not only the history of racism and the history of uh, class exploitation, but also the history of the resistance. And if we aren't aware of those who uh, as, whose struggles uh, uh, created democracy as an aspirational uh, notion, not as, as uh, um, a given set of affairs, not as a a, a, a simply a way in which government is organized, but but a, a, um, a struggle for a more just, uh, more equal uh, society. If we eradicate that from our history, then we have nowhere to start. We don't um, acknowledge the continuum on which our struggles 
unfold. Right, exactly. And the idea that having a communist be the vice president would actually be part of this, tr this history of expanding democracy, not something to run away from. Um, well, you know, I was much like a candidate of the Communist Party for vice president, I so I can relate to that. <laughs> That's the world I want to live in, though, where you won. Um, uh, no, I think, I mean, you know, it's, I recommend this as a, as a as a way to spend one's time reading this history because, you know, incredible, powerful fights that came before. And, um, you know, I, I thought I knew it. And it turns out the more I read, the more I realize I didn't. Uh, how about reflecting a bit on the connection between incarceration and democracy? Um, because you are known, of course, for your work around prison abolition. Um, you know, and I, I, I do want to highlight that we're heading to an election where the the fact of felon disenfranchisement in Florida may be what tips that state towards Republicans. That's what happened in 2000. We hear a lot about how the left lost that election, but you can make a much more compelling case, I think, that felon disenfranchisement was a problem uh, and um, there. But it's much deeper than that. It's a bigger thing. Um, you've pointed out, you know, that uh, de Tocqueville's Democracy in America only came after he wrote a, a paper touring the nation's prison. So it's a foundational relationship, incarceration, uh, liberal democracy. And I, you said something I just want to say here. Uh, in, you, you said in a talk, imprisonment uh, is the negation that liberal democracy required as evidence of its existence. Mm -hmm. It's this constitutive negation. And in my book, I cite Aziz Rana, who wrote a book called The Two Faces of American Freedom, but it's, it's you know, a lot of scholars get at this basic uh, epiphany, right? The fact that American democratic freedom uh, was founded on the domination, uh, on domination and dispossession, right? On the enslavement of African peoples, on uh, the attempted genocide of indigenous peoples and theft of their land. So democracy is always, as long as we know it, has long been, twinned with imperial conquest, mm -hmm. with exclusion, with um, exploitation. And so I guess I guess my question to you is, you know, is this constitutive negation or I, it's like this debasing dualism where I only know I'm free if you're unfree, uh, is it intrinsic to democracy or just the version of democracy we're living in? Can we invent a different paradigm? And to what degree do we need actually prison abolition at the center of, of this democratic horizon? that we're talking about. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, it's um, it's very interesting. Um, Patterson's uh, mm -hmm. book on uh, slavery and social death uh, in which he, he's, he speculates uh, that uh, Western democracy as we know it um, uh, must have uh, evolved from the yearnings of the enslaved to be free. Uh, so the very concept of freedom then that we uh, work with uh, uh, in many ways uh, requires a sense of unfreedom uh, 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 in order to uh, explain its emergence. Uh, uh, and, 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 and certainly, as, as, you, as you pointed out, slavery was the palpable evidence uh, to those who were not enslaved that they were free. How do I know I'm free? I, I'm, I know I'm free because I'm not a slave. Uh, uh, but of course, the emergence of, um, of prisons as punishment in conjunction with the the rise of the, the the revolutionary ideals and emergence of, of, of democracy, uh, um, um, imprisonment, punishment becomes the underbelly of, of democracy, uh, 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 and and it's it's actually not conceivable outside of the context of democracy. As a matter of fact, you need democracy, capitalist democracy, in order to um, uh, uh, imagine uh, imprisonment as a punishment. Uh, because what does imprisonment entail? It's, it, it, it entails um, the divestment of rights. And 
it would make no sense in a society that did not recognize individual rights. It would make no sense uh, outside of the context of a, 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 of, a, of a democratic society. I mean, this is one of the reasons why uh, the U.S. Uh, leads the world in terms of the numbers of people um, in, in, imprisoned, uh, incarcerated, uh, even you know countries like China and India that have huge populations do not can, cannot even begin to approach the number of people uh, who are in, incarcerated. So I think I think it's really important to keep in mind uh, that um, uh, that uh, constitutive negation of democracy actually constructs. I mean, that's the whole point of the constitutive negation. It constructs uh, a, a democracy. Um, and, and, and therefore, it has to be denied uh, uh, from those who are in prison. And I, you know, I, I, I watched your film and uh, I, was, um, I was really moved. I was moved by so much, uh, uh, so many of the interviews I saw in the film. But I remember uh, this uh, young man, I guess it was in Florida, uh, who was a barber uh, mm -hmm. who had uh, uh, recently been uh, released from a, a prison. And, Ellie, yeah. and what was his name? Ellie. Ellie, yeah. And, you know, I was so moved by um, the way in which he talked about education. And uh, actually, this is this is kind of moving into another area, temporality and democracy. Uh, he, he, he said very casually, he said, you know, it used to be that my people could be killed for, for, for trying to learn how to read and write. Uh, and I was, I was struck by that because um, we are encouraged to think of the, um, the human life uh, lifespan as the framework for what we do. And um, he just very casually um, talked about his people during slavery as if uh, um, uh, he could actually um, smell them and touch them and 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 it was a very small part of the film, but it, but it made me think about the extent to which um, uh, the capitalist democracy, bourgeois democracy, creates uh, restricting and imprisoning temporalities. Uh, and, and our relationship to the past, our relationship to the future is so restrained by the existing uh, 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 forms of democracy. And that uh, if we are to imagine new modes of democracy, uh, we would also have to uh, generate new temporalities. Oh, I love that so much. Um, yeah, he, I mean, Ellie is, you know, one of the wisest people in the in the film, I think. But the temporality question is is really interesting, and I I was thinking of bringing it up, but now that you have, I was I will. I mean, I think we we don't we rarely ask the question of what is democracy's relationship to time, and you know, I what I think uh, is that you know, in a portion of the past has a really heavy hand. If you think of the Constitution, it's these founding fathers, their hand reaching up. <laughs> From beyond the grave, and this hand, you know, this literally this handful of 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 men still having an enormous say over our lives, um, you know, and and um, and that uh, I think in my in my book I think I talk about uh, uh, G.K. Chesterton, who's a conservative critic, and he says, well, tradition is honoring the dead. You know, we can't disenfranchise these esteemed men, um, but we, the, you know, I think we need to expand democracy. Spatially to include, you know, to have an internationalist horizon, but I think also temporally to include future generations, the people to come, and somehow um, uh, make their, uh, you know, make their presence palpable in our democracy. How do we ensure, you know, a world for uh, for people who aren't yet here, you know, not in the pat way of protecting unborn fetuses, but in a meaningful way? How do you ensure that there is a planet? Um, for the people who don't yet have a vote or a voice. So I think that the question of democracy and time is really, really interesting mm -hmm. to me. Um, and something that I, I think we actually really do have to think about. Um, so, and the one thing I, I will say too on that front is I think inherited wealth is another way of the past having power over the present too, right? The accumulation of wealth from bygone generations mm -hmm. uh, weighing down on us today. So. This time question is so is so fascinating. Mm -hmm.
Um, democracy has to be feminist, for sure. I want to invite you to speak on the question, uh, on, the, on the idea of abolition feminism. Uh, the film ends, right, with Silvia Federici, the socialist feminist, saying democracy in the home, democracy in the country, uh, which I think points to the fact that we need to democratize, you know, we need to think of democracy in terms of many spheres of life, not just you know, political sphere that we pretend can be severed from the private sphere, but education, the economy, <laughs> our relationships, and, and even ourselves. Um, I, you know, and, and social feminists like Federici and many others have thought about uh, social reproduction, so the importance of pr product, social reproduction, uh, which is also sometimes just, you know, care work to care for each other in our society. Um, and I guess that's just really coming into relief for me as a democratic issue, as we find ourselves uh, ruled by an administration that just seems so contemptuous of vulnerability, right? And that sees weakness, uh, sickness, um, disability as just, you know, something uh, to be um, mocked uh, and, and, you know, really sort of is this literal it's literally like toxic masculinity and the fact that it just willfully spreads COVID because it refuses to be compassionate and wear a mask. So I, I'm, I just would love to hear your thoughts on yeah, feminism and democracy and the importance of care in mm -hmm. a democratic mm -hmm. society. Well, it's a big question. Mm -hmm. um, and I suppose I would, I would begin by uh, arguing mm -hmm. that, um, our feminism should be much more compassion, much more capacious than it usually is. Uh, we generally assume that uh, when the subject turns to feminism, that we're going to address issues of gender, mm -hmm. and and of course uh, we have to address issues of gender, but feminist approaches uh, um, are are so much um, broader than uh, simply engaging with gender. Um, we've learned how to think, um, you know, to use uh, Kimberly Crenshaw's term, intersectionally, mm -hmm. uh, which means that uh, we've, we've learned how to give expression to different uh, um, connections and intersections and interrelationalities, uh, you know, whether they uh, have to do with gender or, 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 or not. Uh, uh, and abolition um, feminism um, urges us um, to think um, to, to think about uh, what might be required to begin to move in a democratic uh, direction. That is to say the uh, what might we need to dismantle? What might we need to cast into the a dustbin of history, police departments and 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 prisons, um, um, uh, privatized healthcare, etc. Um, but but also um, um, how we think differently about uh, uh, those um, struggles. Uh, so how how would we um, how how would we um, think differently about, um, and let, let me use an example of, of gender violence. Uh, uh, if we uh, did not have to assume that uh, the uh, institutions of policing and imprisonment uh, uh, were not there to uh, um, uh, pretend to solve the problem. Uh, mm -hmm. So we would have to we would have to take a much more complex approach and this is this is what i appreciate about feminism that it troubles our neat analyses it 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 it, it makes us deal with a messy world it makes us recognize uh, that the that social realities don't always reflect the the, the neatness of our analytical categories uh, and that we have to be um, willing to try to begin to approximate the, uh, the, the, the messiness of, of, of social uh, uh, reality. Uh, mm -hmm. and, um, and, and, and so that means that, um, that when we say abolition 
And when we say abolish the police, abolish uh, prisons as, as two institutions that uh, uh, need to be, um, as I said before, cast into the dustbin of, of history. Um, uh, how do we address the problems that these institutions pretended to address but could not? Uh, uh, and also uh, to uh, address the um, um, the personal is political uh, because the personal is always political. And as Silva, Sylvia Federici says in in in, in her conversation uh, with you about uh, uh, the, the the mural, um, but uh, the personal is not um, political in a in a way that. Um, allows us to equate the personal and political. The, 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 the political constructs the personal and what we are often assume to be uh, ideas that, uh, that have been generated by our own individualities. Uh, they are um, ideologies connected with the state. Uh, so a feminist approach would, would argue that we cannot have um, we cannot have, we cannot achieve abolition without also recognizing that we have to uh, 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 adapt a critical stance to our own emotions and to our own ideas, ideas that we assume are our own, but they're often uh, the ideas of the state that work through us. Uh, uh, and so I think these feminist insights uh, are absolutely essential when it comes to reimagining a, a democracy that would be more egalitarian and provide more justice for all. Right, and when you're saying, you know, or if I understand correctly too, the abolition of prisons necessitates the building of institutions of care, of care and repair institutions. And so in that sense, you know, and, um, and uh, addressing our our needs, our emotional needs, and uh, treating people in a very different way. But there will be a lot of care work to do when we're repairing the damage of the system, it seems to me. And also that care work has been incorporated into activist work, mm -hmm. which, is, uh, uh, which is again um, um, an instance uh, uh, that allows us to see the impact of feminism on, um, and when I say feminism, Again, you know, it's one of those terms like democracy. Yeah. Uh, um, people think they know exactly what feminism means, just as they think they know what democracy is. But I'm, I'm not. I'm, I'm, I'm talking about a feminism that is, um, that is anti-racist and that is anti-capitalist and and all of those things. Not just uh, um, um, what we used to call uh, bourgeois white feminism. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and for me, feminism is an intellectual orientation. It's one of curiosity and listening and asking questions and not being the pontiff. You know, there's there's so many dimensions to that word, um, but all good words are complicated, and we uh, that's that's part of their beauty, I guess. I want to ask you a question about capaciousness, and this is the question I would say that that's nearest to, um, uh, you know, sort of my my sort of radical horizon, right? Um, I wanna to talk to you about non-human animals. I think one thing this pandemic has done is made me uh, feel like we have a, an urgent, it's urgent that we bring this issue up because COVID-19 is not a natural disaster. It's a zoonotic illness, as yes. lots of pathogens are, and it jumps species because human beings, driven by capitalist imperatives, are devouring the natural world. Uh, we use 40% of the Earth's habitable surface for our food supplies. Um, you know, the Chinese government, for example, encouraged smallholding farmers to hunt wild game because they can no longer compete with big agribusiness. A uh, similar dynamic led to the emergence of HIV. Farm, farm, people who had been fishermen couldn't compete with the big trawlers, uh, went into wilderness. The next pandemic will probably emerge from an American factory farm, whether it's swine flu or avian flu or a antibiotic resistant superbug because we cram hundreds of thousands of animals into these spaces. Uh, it's striking to me that Donald Trump used the Defense Production Act one time, and that was to keep meatpacking plants open, even against the objection of the workforce, who are mostly immigrant, very underpaid, exploited. Uh, and that was driven by greed, not need. We're talking about a huge industry here that, um, you know, is 
um, the, the risks of it are really becoming clear. There's these the risks of these novel illnesses, and then there's the climate consequences of this, this method of farming too. So I wrote a I wrote a piece with my sister Sonora Taylor, who's a disability rights activist, and we basically said, you know, this moment calls on us to have solidarity across species. And I think there are so many there are epidemiological, ecological, economic, and ethical reasons for the left to question. Uh, our relationship to animals to question meat eating. You know, I think socialists are quick to question private property in other spheres, but rarely, rarely ask, okay, well, what entitles us to treat animals as things, as property that we can exploit, and that uh, and animals as as creatures we can relentlessly dispossess. Uh, so it can seem very utopian, I think, it's uh, to think about including non-human life in our democratic politics. But I, I think it, I personally just really strongly feel our lives depend on it, right? We're seeing that with uh, the destruction of the environment, with these, these illnesses, which were, are, are increasing um, in number and virulence. And, um, and, you know, I think people will often say, okay, well, we need to prioritize humans. And, and as though this is, uh, as though solidarity is a kind of zero sum game. And I guess I, I feel that we have to reject that and expand um, the circle of concern, and I just would love to hear your thoughts on that. Mm -hmm. Oh, absolutely. I, um, I, I completely agree uh, with you. Um, you know, the prioritizing of humans uh, also leads uh, to um, restrictive definitions of who counts as human. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, and, and the brutalization of, of animals is related very much to the brutalization of, um, of um, human animals. Uh, so I, I think that this will be a, a very important um, arena of struggle during the coming period. Uh, uh, the industrial production of food, uh, uh, that um, racial capitalism, has uh, generated, uh, um, and 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 I think that um, I, I I think that uh, our eating habits, uh, which uh, reflect uh, more than our own uh, proclivities, that, that our eating habits reflect the uh, production of of, of food uh, that is uh, governed uh, by racial capitalism. Uh, and I think that, uh, that um, you know, when we think about struggles for freedom and struggles for democracy, uh, the actual issues have transformed over time. Uh, and one of the reasons why I think this um, sense of, um, of the kind of temporalities uh, that in, in, in encourage uh, 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 more expansiveness and uh, uh, more capacious uh, uh, democracy uh, are um, also related uh, very much to our to the to the way we to the way non-human animals uh, and the the flora of the earth uh, uh, figure into uh, our our frame. Um, the, um, uh, the 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 colonization of the planet by uh, by Monsanto uh, has. Uh, has created damage uh, that uh, is inconceivable. Uh, and um, if, if we are to engage in ongoing struggles for freedom and, and democracy, we have to, to recognize uh, that, uh, that the issues uh, will become ever more expansive uh, mm -hmm. because initially, right, the question of democracy um, only addressed a small subset of white men, uh, you know, white affluent men. And then because of labor struggles, uh, 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 you know, perhaps, uh, uh, you know, working class men and struggles for women, um, gender struggles. So, you know, we're, we, 
you know, I'm not suggesting that this is automatic, uh, uh, this um, trajectory of history, but what we have witnessed has been an ever expansive notion about the nature of democracy. And I do not see how we can exclude uh, our non-human companions with whom we share this planet. Uh, uh, and I don't see how we can exclude uh, the, the, the flora. Uh, look, look at, um, and I did a, a, a webinar earlier on uh, during the pandemic with people in the Amazonas in Brazil, and they're having to uh, address, uh, uh, you know, not only the issues of racism as they affect indigenous people and, and, and black people, you know, but also uh, the burning of, 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 the, of the Amazon. Uh, and um, this, this makes me um, want to suggest that uh, in these conversations and in these uh, efforts to uh, 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 broaden our notion of, of what uh, possibilities, what the possibilities of democracy are uh, in, in, in the future, we have to avoid narrow approaches. We have to uh, work against the the blinder syndrome, uh, which means that we can't only think about uh, people in this country. Uh, 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 during one of the other questions you asked me, I wanted to make the point, which I never got around to make because I, I moved in another direction. But as far as the vote is concerned, um, immigrants who live in this country ought to be able to vote. Mm -hmm. uh, because they are a part of the community, yeah, uh, uh, and 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 so so we will also have to address the obsolescence of the nation state. Uh, uh, so I'm thinking about issues that will more than likely come up in the in, in the future. I don't know whether I'm, I I will be around when they become mainstream. I did not think I would be able to witness the mainstreaming of abolition <laughs> and the entrance of, of, the, of the vocabularies of abolition into uh, uh, mainstream discourse. Uh, but uh, here we are. Well, that's exactly what I wanted to talk to you about as the final question. I do want to say that for all the exclusions in American democracy, there was a long period when there was what was called alien suffrage, when actually voting rights weren't contingent on your citizenship. So that's a demand. There's precedent for that. Um, and there are some municipalities where uh, there's residence, residency is all that's required for voting. There are other countries where you don't need to be a citizen. Decoupling democratic rights from citizenship, I think, is a something that we should be talking about all the time. It's a, something that, you know, there's there's a it's 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 there in um, in our track record and should be at the fore. I think, right? What what community are you a part of? Your where where do you live? Not this arbitrary thing of yeah. What passport do you hold? Um, and in some in, in in some states, people in prison used to be able to vote. Yeah. Actually, incarcerated people. Yeah, and candidates would have to go visit the prison and and, and so I think these are um, you know. Sometimes our imagination is close to just things that actually have ex existed before. Um, so I love your, I love this vision of uh, democracy as this, you know, expanding circle. And it, what it conjures for me is people looking back on us and thinking, oh, you know, wow, they lived in the democratic dark ages, you know. Um, so I, I want to. Um, I and, want say, and that mm -hmm. circle changes for everyone. It doesn't remain the same. It doesn't simply mm -hmm. become larger. Mm -hmm. Right. It, it, it qualities uh, are transformed as well. Interesting. Yes. Right. It's not just a expansive thing, but actually the nature of it of it changes. Um, and I think you're right about you know being bigger. I mean, we never look back on history and go, "Gosh, there was just too much solidarity. What a mistake!" Right. <laughs> you don't ever. That's never um, the regret. So. Yeah, I want to think about this this um, democratic horizon. This is where where I want to end. Um, and the work of you know, I'm very concerned with building power. So that's why I have been involved in the Debt Collective, which is a union for debtors. We need economic material power. But I, there's an imaginative part of this, right? There's the democracy. It requires these imaginative leaps, um, getting new ideas out there. You know, we've been trying to 
normalize the demand for debt abolition, for student debt cancellation, and free college. Uh, we've made some progress, but you've done an amazing, uh, you know, with along with critical resistance and I'm sure innumerable comrades getting this radical concept of, of prison abolition into the mainstream. Um, and so I want you to say a little bit about what that feels like. And, and one thing you said in this amazing uh, lecture that David pointed out to, you know, you talked about how sometimes uh, organizers, as they become veterans, uh, start to close their minds to new ideas from, from younger generations, right? They want that process to stop. No more new ideas, no more expansion. <laughs> and so I just I was wondering if you could talk about, um, yeah, your openness. I mean, you are so remarkable in your openness to uh, emerging uh, organizers and activists, uh, your willingness to learn from, from, um, from them, and uh, maybe give some uh, tips on how to be a, a good mentor, you know, and how, how to uh, welcome the, the challenges from future generations of organizers who are going to push beyond what we can see here and now. Well, uh, to keep um, my answer within the mm -hmm. frame of this discussion of uh, democracy, um, I, I think I would say that um, mentorship has to be egalitarian. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, that uh, that that we challenge hierarchies, including uh, hierarchies that are often seem to be seem to be set in stone, such as um, those that uh, guarantee the elder uh, more uh, power and influence by virtue of age, um, uh, and those that uh, command the, 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 the younger generation to follow in the footsteps of, of the older. I think that it's, um, that uh, it should be more egalitarian. Uh, and and I, I think this is one of the ways in which we can um, um, enact um, democratic relationships uh, in uh, the course of struggling uh, for change, uh, um, not only in relation to, uh, in, in, in the relationality of generations, but also in relation to um, uh, you know, for example, those who are in prison and those who are outside. Oftentimes, uh, the uh, those who inhabit the so-called free world assume that uh, they have um, a greater um, capacity to give leadership uh, than those who are imprisoned inside. Uh, mm -hmm. And I, I'm really thankful to critical resistance uh, uh, because from the very outset, uh, the the organization uh, insisted on bringing those who were actually in prison into the leadership. Uh, and as a matter of fact, at the conference that we held in 1998, uh, uh, we insisted that prisoners participate in as many, um, I should say, people in prison uh, rather than prisoners, uh, uh, because... Uh, uh, you know, there's been a, a focus on language and how that uh, uh, affects us as well. Uh, but um, we we insisted that um, the members of the panel, the various panels at the conference, uh, had to include people who were in prison, uh, which, you know, technically it was challenging because we had to set up telephones and mm -hmm. telephone numbers so that people could call from the inside and um, collect. But, but it, was, it, was, it was quite incredible. It was amazing uh, to feel as if we were in community with those who were locked up by inside and that we were willing to um, take their leadership uh, and that their ideas uh, would be given uh, equal equal weight as the ideas of a of a Stanford uh, University uh, senior professor, uh, and I don't think that we have an, enough occasions to engage in that kind of uh, prefigurative democracy. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, 
creating democracy as we struggle uh, for democracy. But I think that that is also a feminist approach that uh, you know helps us uh, uh, to um, um, to um, not only imagine a new world, but to uh, uh, become worthy of participating in that world in the con in the course of struggling for it. Brilliant. That's a that's a, such a wonderful answer, and I think. In the spirit of democracy, we will now um, take some questions from the audience with, with Oscar helping us out. Thank you so much for, for that conversation, Angela. Absolutely, and thank you, thank you. Hi, everyone. Sorry, I was leaning in. I wasn't fully ready for my cue. So if you just saw <laughs> saw my face very close, then, you know, sorry. <laughs> so um, I'll just give a couple questions from the audience. I know we're running a little bit late, but it's been a wonderful conversation so far. And I wanna thank you both for all of your, your time. Uh, then one last thank you to our comrades at Haymarket uh, Books, to John and Anthony. I, I've known uh, the people at Haymarket for at least a decade. Uh, they're the hardest working people in book publishing mm -hmm. because they're motivated by ideology in the best sense of the world. And their ideology is, is a radical uh, democratic egalitarianism. It's a socialism that, that I, you know, I, I think really uh, comes through in, in everything they they, they publish. So anyway, um, cheers to, to Haymarket. Um, so let's start with one question from Jules. So um, I'm paraphrasing here, uh, but uh, Jules wants to know what inspires Dr. Davis about the major social movement of our day, Black Lives Matter, but, but also where it might be stand to learn lessons from the experience of the uh, the new left and the the uh, social movement struggles of the the 1960s for a more egalitarian uh, society so uh, we I guess we could start with 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 that one um, well you know um, uh, that movement is so exciting uh, I, I, I you know I can I can remember, it doesn't seem like it was, um, um, 2014 was um, how many years ago? Six years ago? Uh, the, um, the Ferguson uh, protests and uh, the emergence of, of Black Lives Matter that uh, had an impact not only all over the country, but all over the world. And then uh, more, more, more recently, of course, during the pandemic and the, um, the kind of um, grasping, collective grasping of the meaning of the term Black Lives Matter, which previously had been so often misinterpreted as meaning all lives matter. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, this, uh, 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 the, 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 the tyranny of the universal, as um, I, I, I like to call it, uh, uh, was uh, a, a, a way of of, of uh, discounting the impact and import of uh, looking at the very particular experiences of Black people in this country and arguing that Black lives should matter and that uh, uh, only when Black lives matter will all lives matter. Uh, so I I uh, I've learned so much uh, from. Um, uh, the three uh, women who founded uh, the Black Lives Matter Network, uh, the uh, Movement for Black Lives. Uh, I'm on the board of uh, the Dream Defenders. Uh, and I think my um, mentors during this period have precisely been the young people who have taken up the struggles uh, uh, of, of uh, the past and have given them so much more substance uh, have, um, you know, it inspires me because I see that there is a generation that takes for granted what we struggle so long and so hard to figure out how to even articulate. Uh, um, and they not only know how to articulate it, but they know how to, to uh, expand it uh, and, and, and to, uh, um, um, develop uh, uh, ways of transforming the world that are truly uh, inspirational. I, 
Uh, you know, I think our role is basically uh, to um, to prevent the younger generation from making uh, uh, the same mistakes that we did. Um, I think mistakes need to be made. And I always point out that oftentimes we learn so much more from our mistakes than we do from what we did uh, correctly. Uh, uh, and that the younger generation has to be uh, permitted to experiment uh, and to, to not do it um, correctly uh, 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 in the course of trying to figure out, you know, how one builds movements. What is the language uh, that appeals uh, to uh, people? How can we persuade people that uh, even though we are living in a world that is made by capitalism, by racial capitalism, um, and that oftentimes our dreams are even uh, constructed in accordance uh, with uh, 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 capitalism, how do we nevertheless uh, uh, create a critical uh, response? How do we encourage people and movements and organizations uh, uh, to um, uh, recognize that uh, ultimately, ultimately we are going to have to dismantle this system and move in a socialist direction. Well, there's a question um, uh, from that, that in the, in the chat that I think flows from it, from, from Erica, which is, are we missing something as far as organization? So when we think about the, what sustained uh, the generations from the old left to the new left and, and beyond, often they were too rigidly tight democratic centralist organizations, but there was some sense of membership and debate about program and the ability to take the energies of, of activists and, and kind of direct it and channel it into, into organizational vehicles. Uh, it seems like, obviously, we, we see the growth of, of several organizations on the, on the left. I'm a member of the Democratic Socials of America, but it seems like we're far more diffuse now, which obviously has some, some benefits to it, but but I, I guess can you can you comment on whether there's anything we've we've lost and should try to find again? Um. Um, yeah, that would be a very long conversation. <laughs> um, yeah, um, I can talk about a range of things, but I think I'll focus um, for the moment on internationalism. Uh, uh, you know, I was a member of the Communist Party. This is actually how um, my trouble started <laughs> when I was fired from my first job uh, because of my membership in the Communist Party. Um, but uh, uh, I tell you that you know sometimes I, 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 I wonder why we have not been able to. Uh, create that sense of connectedness, uh, uh, that that sense of emotional connection with people in other places and other parts of the world. Uh, you know, why is it that that black women uh, who are moving to the fore in this country are not uh, more connected to the black women's movement in Brazil? Uh, uh, I continually remind myself that there is so much that we can learn from the struggles of, 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 of Black women in, in Brazil. Not, not, not only uh, uh, women like Marielle Franco, who was assassinated, or uh, Erica Malanguinho, who is the first Black trans woman to be elected uh, to a um, uh, state uh, uh, a parliament in, in Brazil, uh, but uh, the histories of, of, of black feminism that are are so much a part of Brazil, uh, largely because of the power of um, of the impact of uh, uh, African uh, uh, religions, uh, Condomble and other religions that that um, that uh, highlighted the power of of, of of women. So I'm 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 yearning for the kind of internationalism that uh, make us uh, feel. Uh, strong, that make us recognize uh, that our uh, desires are desires that animate people all over the world, in Africa, in Asia, in Latin America, in Europe, uh, in Australia. Uh, 
So if I were to ask, you know, what I would like to see now, um, that would be my answer. And 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 I, I, I'm not suggesting that there is no internationalism because obviously uh, the uh, uh, the part played by Palestine, for example, in uh, uh, pointing the way to our um, abolitionist struggles in this country has been so um, essential. Uh, the, uh, uh, the, 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 the fact that abolition simply isn't about getting rid of prisons, but it's about uh, the whole carceral uh, 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 regime and 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 we see in occupied Palestine the way in which carcerality characterizes uh, the ways in which people are controlled in 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 the community, and we have to beware of that. Uh, so I want internationalism now. Can I just say though, I do think uh, I mean I one hundred percent agree. I also think that the. the commenter just is right that we need organizations we need to be organized and you know going back to the question about the suppression of the left i think there's a reason you know there's there's a reason why we don't have a lot of strong robust uh radical left institutions and we have to reinvent those for this moment um and you know we have to i think especially build associations focused on economic power that's you know why i've devoted so much energy to figuring out how to organize debtors because we live in a financialized economy we are forced into debt for education healthcare our own imprisonment our own incarceration and this debt is someone else's asset it's a leverage it's a leverage we can wield um but you know also new forms of labor organizing organizing gig workers and we have common enemies that connect us internationally if you know Uber drivers held a global strike because these companies are now multinational corporations. You know, uh, financial uh, the financial entities that um, that we're in hock to are also often global entities. Our communities are indebted to Goldman Sachs. You know, whether we're talking about people in in Greece or people in the United States. So you know, I think, but but organize organizations is really key, and we we need to invest in them, and we need to. Uh, experiment and make them. And, and on the question of internationalism, when I even think about a relative low period in the, the US left in the 1980s, there was still a period of tremendous solidarity with with the struggles in Central America, with the, the struggle in, in Grenada, you know, a struggle I know that you were involved with, Angela, and it's been virtually forgotten, but it was really um, the most incredible thing to happen in the English-speaking Caribbean, um, you know, in, in its, in its uh, history as far as an emancipatory um, uh, moment and, of course, you know, the anti-apartheid struggle in, in South Africa. Um, so there's there's a question which is another difficult one, um, but maybe this is a good place to... Uh, actually, we'll do one more after this one, so we won't end on this one. <laughs> but there's a question, is it possible to have a democracy under a capitalist system? If so, what mechanism do you think we have to actually achieve a real democracy instead of the theater of electoral politics. So I do apologize. I think it's a good question, but it's so broad that it encompasses basically the entirety of this talk. So you could pick any any particular um, um, part of that, but obviously, you know, there is a tension between democracy and, and capitalism, as, as you both have been been talking about. But then there's also that that step of wanting a deeper democracy than just electoral politics. And, and sometimes it's a bit easy to say, well, under socialism, we'll have real democracy, we'll have workplace democracy. And I guess people are wondering, is there an intermediary step? Is there some forms of, of democracy that we could create and enrich kind of before the revolution? Mm -hmm. Well, this is what we should be doing. Um, and I, um, I think I referred to a, a kind of um, um, enacting of democracy in uh, the course of our um, engage, engagements, uh, uh, intellectual engagements, act, uh, activist engagements. Uh, and I'm thinking that, um, um, you know, academics, uh, often, uh, uh, most often, tend to imagine themselves as solitary individuals who are 
uh, engaged in uh, labor uh, that is um, uh, individual, individual, or in, in or individualistic. Uh, um, so, what would it mean uh, to reconceptualize uh, um, intellectual labor? What would it mean to uh, develop a more collaborative notion of 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 of, uh, of research uh, and analysis, I, you know, I love Stuart Hall because he's so insisted on uh, 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 transforming intellectual work into um, democratic uh, uh, labor, uh, and there's so many other examples that uh, I, I could I could give uh, uh, as we as we struggle for uh, vast changes, uh, we also engage in the process of bringing about uh, changes in our lives. And this is, of course, the, 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 the feminist dimension as well. Yeah, I guess, you know, I, I have an um, post-capitalist horizon as my ideal for democracy, but I, I would emphasize democratization it's not, you know, something that just doesn't exist, or it exists in some perfect form that's frozen in time forever. Um, so, you know, I, the theater of electoral politics—that's a yes, it is a spectacle. But there are ways to engage it that are meaningful. I think I'm very heartened by socialists engaging at the primary level, and realizing that those are actually some of the only competitive elections because of the way you know, our districts are run. You know, it's often preordained that a Republican or a, a Democrat will win, and so that's where you can intervene. And, and have socialist candidates who then um, can win and shake things up. So, you know, look for the spaces where, where uh, there's more substantial engagement. And then, uh, you know, I think there are lots of places where we can prefigure our, our democratic practices. And, and that means like experimenting. It's, I'm, I don't really know what that even means. I mean, part of my trajectory of learning and thinking about democracy was a response to Occupy Wall Street and the insistence on direct democracy, which I, I didn't think um, <laughs> worked, but it got me. It got me thinking. It got me um, engaging, and you know now I do a lot of my day to day democratic deliberating and struggling with the debt collective as we try to build this new institution uh, and demand uh, the abolition of these immoral and unjust debts and the provision of public services that we are entitled to. So I think you know it. it it's that process of, of experimenting and trying to even figure out what we mean when we say we want to have democracy in the here and now. <laughs> um, you know, and, and, uh, and, you know, I think to the organization question, just because I brought up the debt collective, I think to that question of democratic centralism, I think sometimes doing the work, you know, respecting that people don't have a lot of free time, they don't have time for freedom to be an endless meeting, democracy to be an endless meeting. So things you can do where you um, are able to uh, provide strategic resources, to um, create uh, modes of engagement that are actually worth people's time and, and are respect, respectful of their busy lives and that have a chance of having some sort of transformative payoff, whether it's a psychic transformation, like I'm no longer ashamed of the fact I'm indebted and exploited, you know, I'm angry, that's, that's a benefit, or even, you know, getting money back in people's pockets. I mean, there has to be, you know, not everybody is just not everybody is as motivated as some of us who are you know born activists to 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 be um, doing the work every day. We have to also entice people and give them some reward or the possibility of it. We need politics that can deliver the goods, and of course, uh, consciousness isn't a linear thing. You know, there are there are uh, years in which people who previously might have been so called apathetic, at least that's what the, the academic literature would call them, then realize that politics can in fact change their lives and 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 change it for the for the for the better. And and obviously we're working at Jacobin, our, our colleagues at Haymarket are doing that. These two great thinkers are doing it in their their work trying to lay the terrain for that kind of uh, work, that kind of emancipation, which will obviously come from working people themselves. Um, so I think that's a great place to end it. Um, please, for everyone watching, uh, press like. That's how we'll get the video to more people. Uh, thanks again to everyone involved in putting on this event uh, for, for giving their, their time. And, and thanks to Connor Julies for 
running the show behind the scenes at the, the technical level. Um, and yeah, thanks. Thanks again. I appreciate it. Thank you. Everyone.